Sean. We pray, O oh Father, that you'd be gracious to, to give unto us the wonderful blessing of seeing fruit, of seeing the seeds that are planted, that they fall upon that ground that is uh, prepared and that there would be precious soul saved. We also pray, Father, that you would revive us who are your children. Revive us with your word. And as we are entering into this season of remembering and celebrating the, the wonderful blessing of Christ's birth, Father, may it not only be that we, we celebrate uh, just in a worldly fashion, but Lord, that we would celebrate with the joy of the Lord in our hearts and with the, the great, wonderful peace that Jesus promises to give. Oh, Father, we pray again for those going through sickness, those in affliction. May they also be given that peace that passes all understanding, that they would be reminded of your wonderful presence with them, and may they have that joy. And if it's again your will, Lord, that you would raise them to full health and strength, we pray that that would be accomplished even today. So use me for your glory and honor to preach your word faithfully, Lord. We do pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are having, again, our time together in the word, dealing with the subject of this season, and that is the coming of the Lord. And so I invite you to open to another portion of scripture, and that's Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. So you're turning there, I'll just remind you that we have some material that you're welcome to take, a, uh, not just one, take a bunch of these uh, that are give the gospel message. One, as I mentioned, that our, our brother uh, Lloyd was a part of helping to put together as a track that gives the gospel message in English as well as in Punjabi, and they're on the table. You have neighbors and others you can hand those to. Or also this booklet that has uh, the scripture in it and and also gives the gospel message. You can take those, put them in a, a gift you're sending to somebody, just put it in there with it and uh, hand it to your neighbors as well. As we think of Christmas, have you ever had one of those Christmas Days where peace seemed hard to come by, didn't seem very peaceful at all. Everyone was excited about presents, about the, the good food you're about to eat, and what, of course, is needed to be still done in order to get everything ready, and you're far from ready. As time marches closer to the coming of the relatives, tension begins to rise while the Yorkshire pudding falls flat. And uh, soon, due to all the pressures, all the stress, a word said in jest is taken as uh, in maybe a, not the, the way it was supposed to meant, and there's a retort made, and soon the day for peace on earth, goodwill toward men is just filled with anger, maybe even some tears. I hope that that's not going to be the experience of anyone here this morning. Rather, I hope that today and Christmas Day and every day will be a day filled with peace, good peace, God's peace. For it's for peace that Jesus came into this world. And if what we do to celebrate his coming into this world lacks peace, then we're not truly understanding why Jesus came and why his coming is worth celebrating. On December 20th, 1965, in Grace Hospital, Vancouver, British Columbia, sometime after four o'clock in the morning, a baby was born. And it was a handsome little lad. This baby had lots and lots of hair, small little twinkling eyes, a dark complexion. This baby did not look like anything, any way like his siblings. And so much so that as he grew, his brothers would often tease him, saying he was mistakenly switched at birth. There was not much fanfare at his birth. 
nothing that made it into the newspapers at all. His birth was pretty normal, pretty uneventful, of course, except for the mother. Another thing, when he was born, no one had been given any information about his life, what he would be like, and what he would do in his life, what his career would be. As his parents looked into the face of that cute, that cuddly little ball of, of handsomeness, they had no clue at all that he would become a pastor of a little church here in Mission, B.C., Well, over 2,000 years, moving on from that little guy, we come and there was another baby that was born. A baby that was brought into this world. And this baby was just like the other one in terms of him being a boy. He had hair, he had eyes, he had a nose. He may have been a handsome lad as well. We don't know. But there were several things that made his birthday far, far different from my own and from every one of your birthdays as well. Concerning the baby that was about to be born in Luke 1, there is very little normal concerning his birth before, during, and after. We first learn of this baby's parents in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. They had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now, well, stricken in years. Now, once in a while, you do hear about uh, someone in the world having a baby when they're in their 60s, even I've heard of someone in their 70s. It happens, but it's very rare. With Elizabeth... Both she and her husband tells us they were advanced in age. They were, they were older, an older couple. Elizabeth was not only advanced in age, but she also lived a life as a barren woman. She never could have children naturally. And so the birth of the baby could only come to pass through divine intervention. Another thing that made this birth very different from others is given to us in verse 9. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. A little boy asked his mother where he came from, and also where she had come from as a baby. And his mother gave him a tall tale about this beautiful white feathered bird. The boy asked his grandmother the same question and received a variation on this bird story, the bird bringing outside to his playmates. He said, you know, there hasn't been a normal birth in our family for three generations. Well, the birth of John was a mixture of both normal and not so normal. It was a mixture of natural birth as well as supernatural. The supernatural nature of his birth is revealed in the way in which his birth is First of all, revealed to Zacharias by an angel of the Lord, messenger of God. And this messenger of God says to him, don't fear, don't be afraid. And he says this because the message he has is also one that's beyond just the nature of this world. It's a message of hope and promise from God. He tells this aged priest that God has heard his prayer that he and his wife would have a son. And he not only says they will have a son, but he tells him what his son's name will be. I've shared before the meaning of my name, and I don't want to spend too much longer on me, but, uh, and I don't plan to tell the, the meaning of my name, but I will say I still find it odd that among five siblings, me being the fourth out of five, that I'm the only one without a first or middle name that was taken out of the Bible. 
Uh, there is my brother Mark, also known as David. That's out of the Bible. My sister Deborah, with the middle name Grace, both names that are taken out of the Bible. Our other brother, Stephen Paul. Our youngest brother, born after me, his name is Peter Andrew. And then me, Darled Eldon. Strange, isn't it? You can tell by your chuckles that you, you understand. <laughs> Well, the name that the angel told Zacharias to call the baby was John. A name totally outside of the family name. In the Hebrew, it would be Yohananan, which means Yahweh provides protection. Now, it's a, it's a beautiful name. It's a very meaningful name. As he's not only named by the angel, but Zacharias is told the purpose of his special birth, which truly does connect with the meaning of his name. We read in verse 14, And you shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Many of us have found it difficult when we were growing up, getting into our youth and adulthood, to know what our calling in life was to be. Uh, some people, it doesn't it does come very easy. Uh, they know from a young age what they want to do. They, they head in that direction and do what they set out to do. But not so with many of us who at times, you know, we wished for some sort of sign, a sign from heaven. We wish we could look up in the sky and maybe see a message written out in, in the heavens, the clouds telling us what we're called to do with our lives. And for this little baby, his father was told, before he was even born, what God had chosen him for. He was called to go and go before the Messiah and to call the people of Israel to turn and repent and to prepare for the coming of the Lord, the Lamb of God. The angel Gabriel told Zacharias that his son was to be a Nazarite, someone that was set apart by God. He's he to be like Samson in the time of Judges that he was to be kept from anything that would keep him from his calling, uh, which would be even like the wine. He was not to touch that so that it would become a temptation and overpower him. He was to be completely and totally empowered by God to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What a calling. Well, he jumped several months later from this announcement and the baby is indeed born. The promise is fulfilled. Zacharias, because he lacked faith to believe the messenger of the Lord, was told that he would be unable to speak. And that this was to take effect immediately and would last until the baby indeed was brought into this world. The naming of the baby came and another miracle took place. We read this in verse 63. And he asked for a writing tablet, that is, Zacharias did, and wrote, saying, His name is John. <clears throat> and they marveled. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed. And he spoke, and he praised God. So the day it arrived, Elizabeth, we're told in verse 57, she gave birth. Friends and family, they rejoiced, they came together. Eight days later, it was the custom of friends and family to gather together for the circumcision of the child and also the naming of the child. And the custom was that the child, the firstborn boy, would usually receive his father's name. But not this time. Elizabeth states in verse 60 that he would not be named after her husband, but be called John. And so 
everyone was taken by surprise, and so they all turned and they looked at Zacharias. Unable to speak, he writes down for them to read his name. He says his name is John. Then, as the people are amazed at this announcement, the Lord then opens the mouth of Zacharias and as the angel had promised at the announcement of John's name he begins to speak and he just doesn't say anything he says some amazing things from the Lord he sings and he prophesies concerning the grace and the mercy of God for the purpose of the birth of this child in verse 67 it says his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Now before we go through the prophecy that he spoke, I'd like for us to take special note of the last statement of the prophecy in verse 79. Note the sentence, the phrase, to guide our feet into the way of peace. To guide our feet into the way of peace. This is where we come back to the theme of those two passages that we read earlier and to the theme of the third Sunday of Advent, which is peace. The peace that is most often thought of by the greater part of the world, including many Christians, is peace in the world among nations. In the passage that we read in Jeremiah, there was this call of war. There was this call of war, and yet there was this also call of peace, but there was no peace because of war. And that's the type of peace most people are thinking of. Peace meaning an absence of conflicts, an absence of wars in the world. It is true, we know, that at the end of the age, when we enter eternity with Christ in glory, all human wars will cease, they will learn war no more. But as true as that is, there is an even greater meaning. There is, a, there is a higher meaning to the peace that comes to us through the one John prepared the people for, the peace that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that he speaks of has to do with that inward peace, that state of peace. Uh, when used in a worldly sense, it has the meaning of you know just having a sense of tranquility, but this goes beyond them, just a sense of tranquility. In the case here, the peace has to do with the one soul being at peace with God. It is a tranquil state of one soul at peace and assurance concerning their salvation and their acceptance by God. It is that blessed assurance of no longer being at enmity with God, no longer be a con being a condemned sinner under the wrath of God, but now a child of God and accepted of God. It's that soul that sings, what a treasure I have in this world, wonderful peace, buried deep in the heart of my soul, so secure that no power can mine it away while the years of eternity roll. Peace, peace. Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Now the image, the imagery that Zacharias uses in this prophecy is something we can all understand. He uses imagery of feet. He uses the word way when he's talking about the way of peace. This can be also stated as the road or, or the journey. He leads us in the road or the journey of peace. This is much like the picture of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. In that story, Christian leaves the city of destruction and he makes that long, arduous journey, dangerous journey to heaven. And it is a journey where he meets up with all sorts of trouble and testings, enemies of the faith, seeking to, to send him either back to the city of destruction or go on a different path, a different road. And each time he makes the wrong decision, takes the wrong path, he finds himself in great trouble. 
But then the Lord comes. He sends his help and he delivers him and he brings him onto the right path. The path that leads him to glory. The path that leads to the final destination to be with his Savior in the city eternal in the heavens. Now if, if you are saved here this morning, we are on that same path. We're on that same journey. We're pilgrims on a journey of the narrow road, and it is a narrow road, but it is a path of peace. Yes, while we're in this world, that path of peace, we find it's not an absence of conflict. It's not an absence of trouble, but it is still the path of peace that the Lord is leading us on. He's placed us upon it, and he will bring us through that. As another hymn writer that we all know so well said, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. What is it that brings us to walk this road, this path of peace? Let's take a quick look at what God said through this servant, Zacharias. What he prophesies concerning the son, or more importantly, who his son would prepare Israel and the world for. This is what puts us, and has put us on the path of peace and guides our feet on that way of peace. Peace with God, peace from God, peace in God. Now note beginning in verse 8, or sorry, verse 68, that peace has been won for us. Peace is something that was won for us. Verse 68, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which he had been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now, there's so much here that we could spend our time on this morning, but we can only touch the surface. But I want us to see this great truth that the peace that we have in Christ has been won for us. We didn't win it for ourselves. It was won for us. Peace is the fruit of a war. Now that it's not all, we know it's not always the case with war in this world. Many conflicts, they go on for years and years without resolve, without a peace treaty. Yet in the case of a warfare on our part for sin, against sin, the transgression, this peace being one is a fact. Peace is the fruit of war. Peace is one, and it has been one through Christ. And in verse 68, Zacharias is led to praise and exalt the Lord God of Israel. And he's celebrating here. He's celebrating something that the people of God have been waiting for for over 4,000 years. And that is the visitation of God. The Lord God coming in power into this world. And coming for a purpose. And that is to come and fight against the enemy. In order to redeem his people. To set his people who are captives to the enemy. To sin and death. To set them free. As he praises the Lord. He uses images of military might and of warfare. From verse 68 through verse 75, the blessing of God, the praising, the worshiping of God is due to this image of this military might, this authority and power entering in to save his people. You might call this portion a celebration of God's triumph to bestow his grace and mercy upon his people by visiting or coming and entering in and fighting on their behalf. We can make that personal, fighting on our behalf. And this is evident through the terms like visit and also raising up a horn. 
The word visit in Koinonia Greek describes a general or a king, a leader. And it's like a king coming to where his people live and he sees an enemy has taken them captive. What would that king do? Would he just return to his own palace? Would he forget about them and leave them there? No, that king, he would gather his army and he would go and he would rescue his people. Just like Abraham rescued Lot when Lot and his family and the residences of of, of Sodom were taken captive. Abraham gathered an army together and he went in and he delivered them. And that's what that word visit is an image of. He visits. He leads then to the restoring and the redemption, the release of his people, and he leads them to victory. What a warfare this is. The Lord did this for the people of Israel also in the past when he looked upon his people when they were in the slavery of Egypt. He came and by his actions, by his power and might, he made his power known. He delivered them. He redeemed them from slavery. And this is what he has done for all his elect as the Lord of glory came into this world. He visited us with his presence and with his power and might. Emmanuel, God with us, and by his power and might, and in his triumph, he delivered his people from the slavery of sin, from the slavery of death. And then in verse 69, the word horn also has similar meaning. Because a horn refers to, not a horn you're blowing, but a horn of power and authority. In Daniel, for instance, there are several kings represented by horns who go about battling and conquering other nations. The prophecy is here that God was about to raise up a horn. He's going to raise up a king, a power, a ruler. Soon would come the one promised in Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto you. And then the prophet Zechariah would go on to say that when this king would come, he would cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And then he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. This is that great horn that Zacharias was prophesying. Revelation, Jesus in that book is described in different ways. And one of the symbolic ways that he's presented is as a lamb. And in Revelation chapter 5 verse 6, he's presented as the lamb of God who has seven horns. Seven symbolizes perfection. And so the horn that Zacharias is singing about, the Savior, the Lord Jesus, he's the one with all power and all might, in heaven and on earth. And with perfect power and might, he has visited his people. And Zacharias presents it as though it's an immediate fact, that it is that present fact even at that time. But he was preaching and proclaiming something that the power of that that Christ who had come, that king who had come, was one in which the redeemed of the Old Testament had been delivered as they looked forward to his coming. We today would be delivered as we look past to that time in which he gave his life on the cross and crushed the serpent's head. He visited us and he's redeemed us from death and the power of Satan. He died. He conquered, he set the prisoner free, he crushed the enemy. And this is what the Lord was promising through Zacharias as he testifies of this in this prophecy. God had promised it through the prophets before him. God remembered his promise even when his people forgot it. God kept his promise. Because even though it was now over 4,000 years to the time of Zacharias, since God had made the promise to Abraham, Adam and Eve and made the promise that Abraham, Zacharias, could now by the Spirit of God declare that it was a reality. God was sending his son into the world and Zacharias' son would prepare the way for him. 
Prepare that way for him to visit his people. Make all the, the, the rough places smooth. Make way for the coming of the king. And so Zacharias, being filled with the Holy Spirit, declares where peace would be won. Be won through the one who had come, the savior of sinners. This is a celebration of God's triumph that we continue to celebrate to this day and will celebrate for eternity. Peace is won. Also, peace is wrath removed. Verse 76, he carries on with being filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesies, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for you shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Even though Zacharias is celebrating the birth of his son, he is given by the Holy Spirit the promises that come through the one that John would prepare the way for. He knows his son is not the savior of the world, but he has been chosen by God for this great task task of telling others who the Savior is. It's like Hannah in the Old Testament who was promised that his son would be one like a Savior. Verse 77 talks about to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. What this statement is is that God was providing divine and eternal protection from his own holy wrath. This again is where John's name symbolized what this promise would be fulfilled in Christ. And he states, give the knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. This is a message of wrath being removed, the remission of their sins. Romans 5, verse 8, it says, But God commends his love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When the Apostle Paul was inspired to write Romans 5, and in verse 10, when he wrote the words in the, that truth that we were enemies, that we were enemies of God, he meant that we were in hostility, that we were at enmity with God, and God was hostile toward us. There was a hostility, not only that the sinful heart had against the holy God, but there was a hostility toward us against by a holy God. We were under that hostility. We were under that wrath of God, that anger of God. It is what is in the heart and mind of the fallen sinner, which focuses on the world now rather than the world to come, where the, the mind and heart of of the sinner is still at hostility against God. It is a hot anger against God. But this is also what was against the sinner. It's in that state of hostility, we were condemned. We were under wrath. And remember that this wrath was something that we deserved, and it's a wrath worthy of eternity, an eternal damnation. Sometimes even though I know I'm saved, there are times where I just, I ponder over eternity and I think of eternity of heaven and it's beyond my grasp. But it fills me with joy and thanksgiving. Then I start to think in terms of the eternity of hell. That even is more beyond me, my understanding. and it, It still gives me a bit of trembling when I think of it. But then I think of the joy again of eternity in heaven with Christ. And I think 
I am so grateful, so thankful, but I'm not thankful enough that I have been delivered from an eternal wrath, eternal hell. Because in that state of hostility, me toward God and God toward me, and this is the same for all born into this world, it was while being children of wrath, while being in that hostility, God sent his son into the world. And by his death on the cross, he paid for our souls, our lives. He redeemed us. And with his blood, he covered us over. And he rescued us from that wrath. He delivered us and brought us out from under that wrath. And he did so by, by something so amazing that should cause us just to stand in awe. Jesus bore the wrath. Jesus bore the wrath of God on the cross. Again, it's not just the fact, when we look at, say, the times and as we read the scripture and we imagine seeing Jesus upon the cross as we read of it, we, we can sometimes just get the image of the physical thing that Jesus went through and the blood flowing and how horrible it was. Brothers and sisters, when our Savior cried upon that cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was as though he was experiencing the eternal wrath of hell for you and for me. He redeemed us and rescued us from that wrath. He was bruised for us. He bore the punishment of the transgressor. Peace is won. It was won for us by Christ on the cross. And peace then is wrath removed. In verse 78, it goes on to say, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace is assured for us. It's assured for us because of Christ. Peace is assured for us as it comes to us through the tender mercy of our God. The very God who we were hostile toward and who we were at enmity with and whose, whose holy wrath was upon us. It is through that same God of wrath that through his tender mercy we have received peace. This is the wonderful depths of his mercy. As far and as eternal as hell is, so is his eternal mercy toward us. God's mercy for us as sinners, it's so deep, it's so wide. He's he's the source and fountain of of mercy that no no one could ever find the the beginning of, or the end of, or the, the height of, or the depths of. I spoke about the day spring, as mentioned uh, on the first Sunday of Advent, you remember it's the sunrise. It's, it's a short way of describing the sun rising in the east when the dark night is over and, and the light shines and the, the light helps bring about life in this world. This is Christ. And John's calling was to prepare the way for the light of the world. Jesus referred to himself in Revelation twenty two sixteen as the bright and the morning star. The Lord said in Malachi 4, verse 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Whereas the shadow of death here, it refers to where we are in this world, what we're born into. To this world of sin, to this world of death, this world that is under that condemnation, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Shadow of death refers to the fact that death passed 
on Adam, and from Adam it came to all of us. We're under that wrath because of Adam. But here we have a great promise, a great prophecy made. John would prepare the way of the one who is the one who would bring light and life, bring peace to our hearts in the shadow of death. He would bring us out of that death into his marvelous life. So the great revelation here in this passage is that the one who John would come before would be the light of the world to give life to you and to me. Eternal life. So that we would no longer be dead. That we no longer be under that, that threat of eternal death. We'd be given light and life. Jesus says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That little phrase, light of life, is so powerful and beautiful. Not only gives us light to see where we can go, he not only gives us light to see what kind of, uh, of, of life we live in this world, but he gives us the light that gives us life, life abundant, life free, and life eternal. There's only one light of the world, and that light is Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, you're yet in darkness. You're yet in that, that position of being under the wrath of God and the, the darkness of sin, and the captivity of sin. You're dead. The only light is Christ, and the only life is found in the light of the world, which is Christ. Look to him. He alone directs the feet on the path of peace. He alone brings peace between that sinner and God. Look to him. He won that peace at the cross. Peace that removes God's wrath. Peace that gives light and life forevermore. In 1555, Nicholas Ridley, for his witness for Christ, was burned at the stake. On the night before his execution, his brother offered to remain with him in the prison chamber to be of assistance to him and to be a comfort to him. But Nicholas declined the offer and he replied that he meant to go to bed. He would sleep as quietly as ever he did in his life. How could he sleep like that? Because he knew the peace of God. He could rest in the strength of the everlasting arms of his Lord because he knew that peace had been won by Christ, that the wrath of God was removed, and that he had life and light. He lived eternally with his Savior forevermore. You know that's so true for each and every one of us. Have you ever thought and wondered what it would be like to face persecution like that well we can rest like he did because of Christ peace that Jesus gives again it's not the absence of trouble but is rather the confidence that he is there with you always peace was won by Christ who fought for us on the cross peace is wrath removed as Christ bore God's wrath for us on the cross Peace is light and life as Christ defeated darkness and death for us at the cross. At the cross, at the cross. Where I first saw the light, the burden of my heart rolled away. What a blessing to know the one that the angels proclaimed to the shepherds. When Jesus was born, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Let's sing of that peace in Christ. I'm going to sing, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. <laughs>